Welcome back to the channel, particularly to those who are new subscribers after my last video on the ethnic cleansing of Palestine. Today's review is going to be on the Israel lobby and U.S. foreign policy. John J. Mearsheimer and Stephen M. Walt. This was also written around the same time. I think it came out in 2007 as the ethnic cleansing book did. Yeah, 2007. After which Professor Mearsheimer was, as predicted, uh, smeared as an anti-Semite. So now that we've talked about the historical circumstances behind how Israel came to be what it is today, which is in possession of a bunch of land with residents that they never planned for and that they have no real plan for, uh, who've decided to stay because it was their homes um, that their family had lived on for, for a lot of time. Now that we've had a chance to take a look at Palestine, I wanted to take a deeper look at Israel and its relation to the United States. What is the important pledge that is always given by American presidents, American presidential candidates, especially lately, is you have to put on a kippah, you have to go to the Wailing Wall, you have to close your eyes, you have to touch the Wailing Wall, and you have to prove that the greatest friend of Israel is America, whatever that means. Now, there is no logic for Israel and America to be greatest friends. So I want to walk through that today with some quotes. So I have these all marked out for parts in which um, this can be disputed. So let's start with the idea of the formation of the country, right? America is a secular country. It happens that there are some religious people that live in America, even let's say a great percentage of the population professes some kind of religion and actually practices it. However, America is not a religious country. It's not founded on a religion, and people are free to practice uh, or not practice religion. Israel is a state that's founded on Judaism, even though it may profess to be secular. It is guided in many ways by religious principles and a call back to a religious identity that goes back to the time of the Bible and King David. Um, and so there is no similarity there between the types of countries. One that has, you could say, some ancient tie to biblical times, thousands of years old. There is some connection, you could argue. America has been around for about five minutes, a couple hundred years old, secular country, pluralistic. So there is no connection between Israel and the United States in terms of the type of country it is. So we can't argue that they're great friends because they're very similar in how they're founded. They're not. There's no similarity there. What about what the interests are in the Middle East? The United States wants a stable Middle East, generally speaking, because of its longstanding policy of easy access to oil. Now, over time, the United States has started to become a greater producer of oil. And so it, that situation has not been as necessary. The oil must flow if we think about the spice must flow and the Dune review I did some time ago, that that the America still doesn't want, while, while it doesn't have the same dependency it used to, it still doesn't want problems in the Middle East. It's very unpopular here now, particularly in the United States, with the withdrawal uh, from Afghanistan. It's not something that the American public wants to be embroiled in. Israel uh, doesn't really care if there's peace in the Middle East, has has been prepared to go to war, has forced war to happen. Uh, the 1973 war is admitted by top Israeli generals as something that they provoked, something that they wanted to happen because they knew they were in a superior position and then they would win. And they're talking, they talk about bombing Iran, they sabotage Iran's nuclear reactors. They, they're okay if there's conflicts in the Middle East, and they were one of the people that pushed for the war in Iraq. So... Israel really doesn't care if there's peace in the Middle East. It's not in their interest. And because it doesn't allow them to present themselves as people who are having to defend, defend themselves when, in fact, they are the aggressors. So some, some quotes ar around this. Um, Palestinians have used terrorism against their Israeli occupiers as well as innocent third parties. Their willingness to attack civilians is wrong and should be roundly condemned. This behavior is not surprising, however, because the Palestinians have long been denied basic political rights and believe they have no other way to force Israeli concessions. As former Prime Minister Barak once admitted, 
Had he been born a Palestinian, he would have joined a terrorist organization. <laughs> I, just, I don't know. I don't know how else when you're quoting here. Here's another one former um, from Barack's former uh, foreign minister, Shlomo Ben-Ami, uh, who was at Camp David. He said, if I were a Palestinian, I would have rejected Camp David as well. So there's always idea, oh, the Palestinians reject peace. We have we have a former prime minister saying if he had been born in Palestinian, he would have joined a terrorist organization. And that a former foreign minister saying if I were a Palestinian, I would have rejected Camp David. So who's doing the rejecting here? Or do the Israelis know that what they're doing is unreasonable and causing people to become terrorists? Or what they're offering at Camp David is not reasonable and forcing people to reject it? So... I, I'm willing to believe the Israelis when they say these things. So do, does America want the same thing in the Middle East as Israel? That's not clear to me. America is a multiracial state. Doesn't mean that we live in harmony and all races get along very well here, but it means that the country was not in itself founded on a single racial identity. In fact, we had a number of colonial powers who came in addition to the indigenous uh, or the, you could say the, the long traveling um, Asians that came to America in the beginning. You had the French who colonized, you had the Spanish who colonized, and you also had the English who colonized. So America was colonized by multiple people. It wasn't just colonized by the English. It so happened that the English gained the ascendancy, but as we can see for various reasons, that's in decline now. But the United States is generally open to everyone. There are probably more languages spoken in New York City than in, in many major cities. Uh, around the world. We're not talking, obviously, Africa and, and Asia. There are so many languages spoken in a country. But let's just say in New York City, there's just so, so many languages. I've heard like you know, 200, something like that. In any case, Israel is not. Israel is a state by Jews for Jews. Other people do live there. But if you're a Palestinian, you're a second class citizen at almost every level, whether that's in higher education, whether that's holding political office, all of those things are are documented. It's not a conspiracy theory. You can read it in Heretz. You can read it anywhere else that you'd like, the Jerusalem Post. The fact is that Palestinians do not have, they don't even have the same water rights as Israelis. So the Israeli government has an official policy of apartheid. That is a fact. The US government and America, for all the problems that, and I say this as an American citizen myself, all the problems we have as Americans, we do not have an official policy of apartheid as part of our government. And we could look to other, I, I, let's be broad, Australia had an official racist constitution until 1970 or so, in which other the people other than whites were allowed to be citizens, right? The, the aboriginals were carved out. And America has a history of this too, the Chinese Exclusion Act at the, uh, the turn of the century. Uh, there are examples of this. Of course, we know South Africa is the most famous one, but Israel and the United States don't have anything in common in this way. I don't know how we would say, oh, we share similar values. We certainly don't when it comes to the makeup of the country. Um, and here are some, here are some quotes. Uh, Menachem Begin once said that Palestinians are beasts walking on two legs. Former IDF Chief of Staff Rafael Eitan referred to them as drugged roaches in a bottle and also said that a good Arab is a dead Arab. Another former Chief of Staff Moshe Yalon referred to the Palestinian threat as a cancer on which he was performing, quote, chemotherapy. So this is what uh, an ethnically oriented state um, offers. Here, here's another a poll released in March 2007 found that 55% of Israeli Jews wanted segregated entertainment facilities, while more than 75% said they would not live in the same building as an Israeli Arab. We've had segregation in America. We know that attitudes like this exist. Not saying that that's good, but to pretend that Israel isn't doing this, uh, how does America and Israel share values when you have these sorts of policies in place? Let's take a look. Um... Prime Minister Golda Meir uh, famously remarked that there was no such thing as a Palestinian prior to the creation of Israel. It didn't mean, obviously, that there was a state called Palestine, but there were people living in Palestine and they referred to as Palestinians. So saying there was no such thing as a Palestinian, this again ties into the myth that the land was empty and we just came to grab an empty land. 
even if that were true, it didn't mean that you could evict everyone and claim the land for yourself. And that is effectively what's happened in contravention of international laws and resolutions. And finally, America is a signatory to the Non-Proliferation Treaty, the, non the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. Guess who isn't? Israel. Um, if the United States could live with a nuclear Soviet Union or a nuclear China, whose former leaders were among the greatest mass murderers the world has ever known, and if it can tolerate a nuclear Pakistan and embrace a nuclear India, and might I say, Pakistan and India can stand each other, then it could live, however reluctantly, with the nuclear Iran as well. Why can America not live with a nuclear Iran? Because Israel cannot live with a nuclear Iran. But if we look at all the other nuclear conflicts, as we say, Soviet Union, nuclear China with Mao, far more mass murders uh, than, than on any other scale we've ever seen. Pakistan and India, who hate each other, who've been at war over and over, they're both nuclear, nuclear armed and they haven't killed each other. Mutually assured destruction is a proven idea. And, but the United States has to take Israel's lead. But once again, America is a signatory to the non-proliferation treaty. Israel is not. So once again, how are America and Israel friends? How are America and Israel sharing values? In none of these circumstances that, in none of these points that I've talked about, does Israel and America share any values? We don't, we're not in the same continent. We don't have the same strategic aims. It's just, there's the, the idea is a completely fictional one. Uh, that's been manufactured for for lots and lots of different reasons, which I, I can't get to fully. In, in as I talk about this book, as you can see, there's there's more than three hundred pages plus endnotes for you to go into. But I just wanted to talk about those things. Now, why does Israel need America's support? Right? They may want America's support, but why does it need? Well, first thing is money. In order to carry out these attacks, in order to fund their desalination program, all these things, Israel may be a powerful country with its own economic growth and engine and there's a very entrepreneurial spirit in Israel. I've 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 seen it as I've met the locals and, and run into them. I, I love that entrepreneurial spirit. However, they could not live the life that they live without US foreign aid, which I think there's a statistic in the book. It works out to something like a direct subsidy of five hundred dollars per Israeli citizen directly from the United States. Why else? Israel doesn't have a seat at the UN Security Council, so it needs the cover of the United States for, for things like this. Um, here, Professor Mearsheimer points out, or and Professor Walt perhaps as well. The second element of Israel's strategy, its attempt to, and we're talking about the war with Lebanon here, its attempt to punish Lebanon for allowing Hezbollah to operate freely was also searching to backfire. A wealth of historical evidence and scholarly literature makes clear that inflicting pain on an adversary's civilian population rarely causes a rival government to throw up its hands and surrender to the attacker's demands. And that's what we're seeing now. Okay, so we're going to kill a bunch of Israelis, uh, of Palestinian civilians. Therefore, they're going to give in. No, that's not what's going to happen. And Israel knows that, but they're okay with that because it accomplishes what they want anyway, which is the killing of these roaches, these uh, beasts, um, this cancer that needs uh, chemotherapy. Again, I'm just quoting Israeli foreign ministers and government officials. Professor Mearsheimer also points out, having the right to defend oneself does not mean that any and all measures are legally or morally permissible. I've said this, that if I had somebody in a cage and I deprived them of water and food, and once I walked by their cage every now and then, uh, a chicken bone came out and scratched my neck, or a chicken bone blinded one of my children, and then I say, well, I have a right to defend myself, and then I go in and I, I, uh, I drop a bunch of uh, hot tar on them or boiling water. And then I say, well, see, I'm defending myself. It's like, well, how, how do you think these people are reacting like this? Do you think they're reacting like this because they don't have anything better to do? I'm not trying, I'm not saying that there is no element of animus between Muslims and Jews. Keep in mind that not all Palestinians are Muslims. There's plenty of Christian, not plenty. There's some Palestinian Christians. There are some Palestinians who are in, uh, of different religions, but the idea that they're, that it's only about the Islamic and Jewish thing, it, it's, it's false. What else do I want to talk about? I've gone way over my, what I like to talk about regularly. Um, we have an Israeli soldier talking about the end of the Lebanese war who helped flood the area with cluster bombs. What we did was insane and monstrous. We covered entire towns in cluster bombs. Um, and 
When the fighting finally stopped in mid-August, UN officials estimated there were about 1 million unexploded bomblets in the southern part of the country. So as I say, that's the sort of reaction. Uh, a prisoner in a cage throws out a chicken bone, scratches my neck, blinds my child, and then I pour boiling hot water on top of them and then, and then cut off one of their fingers and say, I'm just trying to defend myself. That's the idea. of Israel has a right to defend itself. That is a far different thing than having the right to bomb and murder civilians. And, and I want to keep in mind, bombing and murdering civilians is something Americans know a lot about because that's what we did at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So I'm not trying to pretend that America has its hands clean. If that hasn't been clear in my previous video and in this one, I want to make it clear America does not have clean hands in this conflict at all. So then the question is, why do they hate us? And George Bush infamously said, you know, because of our freedoms, Britney Spears, all this, we get to go shopping. That's not why. Um, and this, uh, this, this support um, that we've given, this was a June 2003 Pew poll found that in 20 of 21 countries surveyed, including close U.S. allies like Britain, France, C Canada, and Australia, Either a majority or a plurality of the population believes that U.S. Middle East policy favors Israel too much. What is more surprising, perhaps, is that a plurality of Israelis, 47%, agreed. So even some Israelis agree that uh, the U.S. gives too much uh, foreign policy cover. Finally, uh, I'll, this is a little longer. In the aftermath of the September 11th terrorist attacks, the main strategic justification behind U.S. support for Israel became the claim that the two states were now partners against terror. This new rationale depicts the United States and Israel as threatened by the same terrorist groups and by a set of rogue states that back these groups and seek to acquire WMD. Their hostility to Israel and the United States is said to be due to a fundamental antipathy to the West's Judeo-Christian values. Well, Judeo-Christian is not a thing, but onwards. Values, its culture, and its democratic institutions. In other words, they hate Americans for what we are, not for what we do. In the same way, they hate Israel because it is also Western, modern, and democratic, and not because it has occupied Arab land, including important Islamic holy sites, and oppressed an Arab population. So, the idea that the, the terrorists hate Americans because they have Britney Spears and Coca-Cola and freedom, as opposed to what you do. What is it that you do in this region of the world that causes blowback? And that's that's on my shelf as well. If you haven't read Chalmers Johnson's uh, blowback, that's fundamental for understanding why we have problems in parts of the world due directly to foreign policy choices. Which brings us back to this book, The Israel Lobby and U.S. Foreign Policy. If you'd like to read it, there'll be a link uh, down below in the in the video description for you to buy it. If you'd like to support the channel that way. You can also hit like, subscribe, share this video with people who you think could benefit from it, whether they like to hear it or not. All of these things are documented with numerous endnotes, and it's written by, as with the ethnic cleansing of Palestine, a university professor, or at least someone who's an academic, who's, who doesn't have any skin in this game because uh, they, they're looking to profit financially. They are trying to go after the truth, and I think that that's something that's really important. Also, if you'd like to support this even further, you can subscribe to my Patreon. That link that is linked as well, as well as there's my Amazon wish list. If there's another book that you'd like to uh, see reviewed, feel free to buy one from there, and I'll, I can possibly review it. Next, my next book review will be the last one in this Israel-Palestine examination, and it's going to look at possible peace deals. Um, from a book that I read about the different policies that have been proposed, so. As I say, the first video was to look at Palestine side. This was to look at question of Israel. And my last review will be to look at, is there a possibility of peace? And I hope to answer that in the next video. Until next time, enjoy your reading.